Y'all ready? You're released. All right, into the wild. Got a hot mic. Better say something that's going to get me elected. <laughs> all right, so today, you all know what you showed up for, navigating your nutrition during the holidays without being that guy or that girl. Uh, so I'm not going to tell you to like restrict yourself and be crazy over the next month and a half. Uh, but what I do want to do, I've got some stuff prepared for you that we're going to go over, but I'm also going to, this is a workshop, so I want to hear from you like what your challenges have been in the past with the holidays and eating and drinking and all those things, and then we can just kind of work through what those issues are in your life and come up with some solutions that you can implement over the next month and a half, so it's actually really practical for you. Um, so our learning objectives tonight are to figure out how to manage multiple holiday dinners and parties. So. How many holiday dinners and parties do you already have on your calendar? Just like throw out a number. Four. Four? four. Yeah. yeah, it's pretty standard. You've got about four family dinners and friend parties as well. So we'll figure out how to manage those and uh, you know, not end up really restricting yourself, but at the same time keeping your nutrition in check and not starting the year off on the wrong foot in 2017. Uh, our second learning objective here is how to enjoy your holiday meals guilt-free. That's the not restricting yourself part uh, on Thanksgiving. It's Raquel's first Thanksgiving. So how is she going to enjoy it without being like, oh shit, I shouldn't eat this much stuffing because I only eat 50 grams of carbs a day usually. I tell you. So, <laughs> and then our third learning objective here is how we're going to account for alcohol intake because Obviously, uh, drinking on the road and when you're with your friends and family is just kind of a part of the social aspect of the whole holiday thing. And uh, we're going to talk about some supplements that help with managing the actual physiological part of the alcohol, uh, but also how to account for that alcohol in terms of your nutrition and what actually alcohol is nutritionally, so you can get a better idea of you know, what guzzling down an entire fishbowl of mimosa on a Sunday does to your body. Um, so we've got this and I've got some other, uh, some other topics we're gonna cover as well. But first things first, I just wanna hear from you. Like, What are some of the major obstacles that you've had in the past during the holidays, whether it's during Thanksgiving or any of the December holidays from Christmas, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, and New Year's? The sweets. The sweets. All right, here we go. That's one obstacle. That's definitely one of the biggest issues I see with clients in general when they're out with friends or at dinners and with family is sweets. What other obstacles are we working with? Drinks. Drinks, there we go. You know, when you get drunk, you forgot about all that stuff then. You keep on drinking and eating, so it's terrible. Yeah. My family is not in the fitness and health yeah. of that lifestyle, so when I do it, they're like, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? Like, yeah. just eat whatever you want, but they don't understand it or they don't want to. Yeah, exactly. So family and social pressure. That's part of the... Yeah, that's exactly part of not wanting to be that guy or that girl, especially in front of your family and your close friends who you haven't seen in a while. You don't want to come back. Uh, a lot of people just don't want to have the perception of being that boring fitness person who does CrossFit and is paleo and only cares about CrossFit and <laughs> perpetuates all those things that the media says about us. Uh, you want to show that you're still that person that knows how to have a good time. Uh, but what other obstacles are we working with? You don't necessarily have to even think about nutritionally, but like, what obstacles do you have during the holidays that make it difficult to like stay fit even? Travel. Exactly, travel. Whether it's being on the road, in an airport, or just in a hotel, in an Airbnb. Sometimes Airbnb is a lot better than a hotel, but you know, all the, all the things that come with that traveling package deal definitely are some major obstacles that we run up against. Anybody else got some other ones? I was just gonna say that squeezing workouts in. Exactly, yeah. So y'all actually just built my entire list that I put together before <laughs> this talk. I thought I was gonna have to fill in the blanks, but you all did it for me. So yeah, squeezing an exercise. All right, so we all experience these things during the holidays. It's really difficult. We experience them to different degrees. But um, 
Yeah, so first things first, in terms of holiday parties, has anybody kind of a, you go to a party and you might have been restricting yourself for a while and all of a sudden you have this potluck buffet of food before you and you fill up one plate, you finish the plate, but you didn't eat one or two things that your friends or family made, so you grab another plate, you go back up and then someone brought out the first round of the dessert and you know, you've had two plates and then that dessert was really good, so you go back for another. Sound kind of, I mean, that happens to me. <laughs> Definitely happens to me. Um, it's happened to a lot of my clients as well, so I've had to kind of critically think through, like, okay, so how do I help somebody in that situation? You know, it's almost an expected thing. that They go into this situation and all of a sudden they're bringing back two plates of food and a bunch of dessert. So is there anything that any of you have come up with on your own to kind of stave off those cravings, or am I just going to jump right into telling you what to do? You jump on everything? Yeah. So generally what I recommend for my clients is that you don't restrict yourself. You're gonna enjoy that first plate of food guilt-free. Grab whatever you want. Don't worry about your dietary restrictions, especially at this time of year. It's just like, you know, you can kind of throw quality out the window during the parties. Like most of you said, you only have four parties over the next month and a half. Like, you know, you might do a little bit of damage during that time, but if you just completely uh, sequester your bad behavior to those four parties, then you're gonna be all right. Uh, but if you just grab that first plate, throw whatever looks good on that first plate and eat it, then what you can do just mentally is make a note that when that first plate's done, the only things you're gonna pick up afterwards are gonna be a protein source or a vegetable. And I guarantee, because both of those foods are really satiating, they're gonna sit heavy in your stomach, especially protein. If you've ever tried to just eat a huge steak on your own, you're gonna be full like half of the way through, and then you're gonna be pretty much forcing the rest down. So if you jump for the vegetables or you jump for the protein, you're actually gonna feel full and you're probably not gonna to continue to make bad choices or binge on the foods. Uh, I'm also not saying that you have to avoid sweets altogether because most people who are really into their fitness probably don't indulge in sweets too often. So, you know, this is kind of like a sacred time of year where it's like, you know, if uh, you got a nice pumpkin pie, then why not have a slice of pumpkin pie with some whipped cream? Or, you know, if you've got just this dessert that you love that your grandma always makes or your mom always makes and you've been waiting for it, you know, don't restrict yourself. Uh, have that piece of pie, but the same rule applies. After you've had dessert, if you're still like kind of eyeing the table where all the food is at, rather than going back for dessert or one of those foods that has this waterfall effect, where it's like you have one pumpkin pie, you go back for a second small little sliver, and then that small little sliver didn't do it for you. You go back for another small little sliver, and then another small little sliver, and then this whole just, you go off the rails. You ate a bunch of small little slivers, next thing you know, half a grandma's pie is gone in your belly. And that's bad news. So instead what you're gonna do is you're gonna go for the vegetables and you're going to go for the meat after a dessert. Sounds really weird. It's not necessarily something that people would normally think to do, but that's what you should do. It's gonna satisfy you, it's gonna shut off those craving signals and uh, it's not gonna put you in a really bad place. Cool? Does that make sense? Does everyone feel like that's something that they could actually implement and benefit from? Cool. All right. Then no need to workshop it any further. All right. Um, I have a lot of people who said that they're going to be hosting uh, Thanksgiving dinners or Friendsgiving dinners, and they're worried about the fact that they're going to have a bunch of leftovers at their house, and they're worried about the whole, like, oh, no, I'm going to have this party, I'm going to binge at this party, and next thing I know, I'm going to have, like, half a container of stuffing sitting in my fridge the next day. It's dangerous. Yeah, it's really dangerous. If you're going home for the holidays and you're staying with the person that is going to be cooking all the food like I am, uh, then, again, it gets dangerous. You might take two slices of stuffing, a bunch of turkey, some gravy, and whatever, and make a stuffing sandwich. That, I mean, you're getting in dangerous territory. But uh, the way that you can kind of navigate the next day, the leftover day, is your quality of food might not be great, and that's kind of gonna be a theme over the next month and a half for you, is that your quality is not always gonna be there, but the thing that you can control is the quantity. So if you're going to have some stuffing the day after, or something that's really like starchy carbohydrate, or something that's really like 
creamy, calorie dense, fatty, like a gravy or something like that, it, like in large amounts, um, control the quantity. Uh, you know, quantity, don't beat yourself up over it. Like you'll get back on track eventually, but uh, you can definitely control the quantity, especially if your goal is to lose fat or even to maintain your current level of body composition over the holiday season. So that's what we want to do there. As I mentioned, we'll just briefly go over it because it's a learning objective. The four times that you are going to actually be at a party with friends or family, I want you to actually put that on your calendar and just know that that's the time that you are going to be eating a holiday meal, a cheap meal, guilt-free. There's actually research that shows that if you put it on your calendar, if you plan to deviate from your nutrition plan every two weeks, it's not going to set you back if you do a cheat meal every two weeks. It's actually gonna keep you on track and a little bit more motivated to stick with whatever plan you're on because you're not gonna feel just totally restricted. Um, so you put it on your calendar, you really just enjoy the shit out of those meals, you cherish it to the max, and then any, like all the space in between, just control the quality, or sorry, control the quantity of the food that you're eating because again you might not have control over quality so like kelly said with family and social pressure let's say that you're visiting your in-laws or you're visiting your family and you know they aren't really into fitness and eating healthy the way you are you know if they if the only green thing they have is like cream of spinach that they pull it out of a tv dinner uh, then you might be in trouble from a quality perspective, but you can definitely make sure that the quantity of food that you're eating is proper. So, I mean, there's gonna be very few times where you walk into a dinner situation and there's not some source of protein. Like maybe if you have an extreme vegan family member or something like that, you might walk into a situation where there's no meat, but that's a rarity. Only like one, 2% of the population is actually vegan, so. We won't really deal with that. There's probably gonna be some meat. So just make sure that your pr plate is gonna be looking primarily like the protein. So that could be the meat or beans, something along those lines. I'm not paleo, necessarily a paleo advocate. If you tolerate beans well, then might as well eat the beans. Uh, the rest of your plate should not be then starch. Uh, the rest of your plate should be whatever green or you know vegetable thing you can muster plus some starch. So, you know, it could be all the rest of it could be greens or it could be a nice mixture of some starch and the vegetables. And usually whenever someone's constructing a dinner, you know, a salad is generally common. It might be iceberg lettuce, not, you know, not the healthiest thing in the world, but at the same time, you can probably, even if you're eating with like some in-laws or family that's not really into fitness the way you are, construct a plate that's conducive of your goals. So, you know, social pressure is gonna be another issue. Some people might find it difficult to manage the family members or friends that throw jabs at you about being healthy, but hey, they're the fat ones. So, uh, anyways, does anybody, does that kind of help people in terms of when you're eating out or at a party or with your family that doesn't really, you know, cater toward your, towards your needs? Yeah. Cool. Um, one of the other issues here, if we tie travel into it, is is anybody going to be staying at like a hotel or not staying at a place where they're able to cook while they're traveling during the holidays? Okay, that's awesome. Um, if you were then you could pretty much just pack some high protein snacks with you to eat uh, while you're in the hotel. But uh, is anybody gonna be flying to where they're gonna be? Yeah, pretty much all of us except for Raquel. So who has trouble eating when they're going to the airport? I mean, it seems to be a pretty common theme that when you go to the airport, the food there generally sucks and it's really expensive and you don't wanna eat it um, it's really easy to just pack a meal with you on the way to the airport. Like every time I go to LAX, I stop at Rainbow Acres. I usually just grab a salad with a bunch of meat, bring it with me on the plane, and I'm a happy camper flying across the country. I'll usually end up bringing some jerky and a protein bar with me as well. 
and you know that tends to do it for me. So, you know, I definitely would recommend grabbing just like a nice little meal, maybe a salad with some some protein on it, some chicken, whatever, beef, and maybe some avocado, nice fat sources, so you actually get a little bit of calories in the mix, and then a little something extra for when you need a snack, especially if you're flying cross country. Cool. Uh, drinks. Let's talk about alcohol. That is one of our objectives here, how to account for alcohol intake. So generally, one drink is going to be between 100 to 150 calories. So if you're drinking, let's say, an exact one and a half ounce shot of hard alcohol, it's going to be about 100 calories. If you're drinking beer or if you're drinking wine, probably going to be about 150 calories. Now, if you were to use a food journaling app and you were to put that into there, you would see that the macronutrient breakdown for the hard alcohol is zero carb, zero fat, zero protein. You would see for like a beer or a wine that it's going to be zero protein, zero fat, and like maybe five grams of carbohydrate. The thing is, this doesn't add up to any calories. All of the calories come from alcohol, which has seven calories per gram. So with all of my clients, I actually have some entries in my fitness pal, if you use that food journaling app, where I broke up the alcohol calories into fat and carbohydrate calories. Uh, so if you wanted to, what you could do is pretty much anticipate how much you're gonna drink on the nights you're gonna go out. Like you probably know which friends and family really like to turn it up and which friends and family are just gonna go out for like a single cold beverage with. Uh, so you can probably anticipate like, you know, every time I come home for Thanksgiving and I'm with my family, we are guzzling down the wine that Uncle Tommy makes in his cellar or something like that. Um, so you can anticipate, like I'm gonna have five glasses of wine. So if you go to MyFitnessPal and then you just search my name, last initial, plus hard alcohol, wine, or beer, those entries are the ones where I split up the alcohol calories into fat and carbohydrate calories. So you can pretty much see like how much caloric impact that alcohol is gonna have. And then you can adjust your eating during the day to match it. So protein is the most important macronutrient. All of my clients, I, the number one thing I want them to do is make sure they eat enough protein. So since I split the macronutrients here between fats and carbohydrates, you're pretty much gonna be looking like, holy shit, there's more than 50 grams of carb in my food journal or there's more than X grams of fat. In my food journal, just from this alcohol, there's already you know, 600 calories from the four drinks I anticipate eating, and I only wanna eat, let's say, 1,600 per day. Then you're gonna to wanna to focus on eating protein sources throughout the day, because you just have 600 empty calories that are gonna be sitting in your stomach later on that aren't gonna be contributing any protein whatsoever, um, and we don't want that. It's gonna to lead to some muscle degradation, it's gonna to lead to no gains and yeah, no bueno. So if you're gonna be drinking alcohol, focus on meat and veggies. You're gonna to wanna to avoid starchy carbs and empty fats, like anything that is fried oils, things of that nature, if that makes sense. Um, the other thing with alcohol is that it usually just makes you feel like absolute shit the next day. A little scientific term, hangover. Um, so there are some supplements that you can use. There are plenty of guides out there online that'll tell you 15 million supplements to take because alcohol depletes B vitamins and electrolytes and it dehydrates you and it does all these things and they're pretty much gonna tell you to just take every supplement that alcohol kind of depletes. It's not really what I'm gonna talk about here because the thing is there's plenty of B vitamins in meat, for example. So if you're eating enough meat, you don't need to be taking a huge B vitamin supplement and so on. The most important supplements I think 
uh, our one activated charcoal. So this is actually like if you've ever had a friend get their stomach pumped in college, this is what they do. They take a ton of activated charcoal, they pump it into their stomach. It's going, so activated charcoal is carbon. If you remember, I'm not going to get into the science, but carbon has this reactive outer electron shell. It's looking to pick up extra electrons. So when we metabolize things, these bad little single electron uh, things called free radicals are floating around. And activated charcoal can pretty much soak those up. Uh, so if you take like a gram of activated charcoal on a night that you've just, you know, you've had a decent amount of drinks, it's not, you don't need your stomach pump, but you've had a decent amount of drinks, you throw back about a gram of activated charcoal at the end of the night, uh, that's gonna kinda help alleviate some of the crappy effects of the alcohol. Number two, Sounds crazy, but it's called N-acetylcysteine. Is it activated charcoal a pill or powder? Yeah, I, I haven't seen it in powder. I'm sure they make powders you can scoop, but for the most part, it's, uh, it's in caps. If you ever get food poisoning or anything like that while you're abroad, it's good to have activated charcoal with you as well. Just a little fun fact there. How do you feel when you take it? You like shit? No, you don't feel like shit at all. You don't even really yeah. notice the, like the charcoal doesn't have any effects on you necessarily. If you take medication, you wouldn't want to take it when you take the medication because it will make it ineffective. But um, yeah, it will definitely make you have a black poopy the next day. So do not freak out if you take activated charcoal. You're not dying. Um, does, the, does the juice count? Because I saw some juice done with charcoal. So that counts? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, N-acetylcysteine is actually a precursor to a antioxidant that your body makes called glutathione. So this actually literally just helps your liver to metabolize the alcohol. So it's just a little bit of liver support. Um, generally, if you take about 750 milligrams, sometimes it comes in 600 milligram doses, but about 750 milligrams, you take it at the end of the night, uh, or let's say away from the activated <coughs> charcoal uh, it's going to help you. You can also take it in the morning. Number three is just going to be some electrolytes. So if you could get electrolytes that have like some vitamin C in it as well, that's kind of an added little antioxidant bonus. Um, but these three things are kind of like the short list of what is going to help you with a hangover. And then just make sure that you hydrate because that's another major component of what makes you feel awful when it comes to alcohol. Yeah. Uh, so, we've covered sweets, drinks, family, travel, squeezing in exercise. This is a big one because you're not going to have the convenience of Paradiso CrossFit, two locations plus a barbell club while you're on the road. Um, you might not have a CrossFit box within an hour of you. Um, so, you know, you might not be able to work out. You might not want to go to a global, Globo gym or on the actual holidays themselves, they might not even be open. So squeezing in exercise can definitely be difficult. And when you've got a really packed kind of social schedule that you're trying to adhere to, you might only have like 10 to 30 minutes. So you're not going to be able to go to a class. So when it comes to squeezing and exercise, the eating like shit and the drinking is one major component of why people go off the rails during the holidays. And then the squeezing and exercise is difficult. You probably come in here three, four, five days a week, and then all of a sudden you might be visiting home for a week, and you might get one CrossFit work in, workout in at best. Uh, so what you can do is do what you can do. So if you only have, let's say, 10 minutes, within 10 minutes you could fit two Tabatas in with a two-minute rest in between the two of them. So just doing anything that you have access to, it's really easy to just be like, okay, Tabata intervals, or I'm going to go hard sprint for 30 seconds, walk for 30 seconds around my neighborhood, or go for a run around the neighborhood. But you know, just doing something to keep yourself moving so you're not sedentary while you're traveling, just being a total glutton, and then not exercising whatsoever. Um, so you don't necessarily have to put a ton of pressure on yourself to make it 
all the way to a gym to go to a class, or you don't have to put a ton of pressure on yourself to find a Globo gym, and then you've been doing CrossFit and you don't remember what the hell these 100 machines could possibly be for and choosing which ones uh, you wanna do. So, you know, just do what you can. It might be like we did Nasty Girls in class today. It might just be Tabata air squats or something like that. You might find a pull-up bar. You might do some pull-ups, something like that. The Pavel Tsatsulin fighter pull-up program is really accessible pull-up program. So there's a ton of stuff that you can do, ton of just resources on the internet for programming for hotel wads. Like Jason Kalipa has this huge cache of hotel wads that you can choose from. Uh, so there's always something you can do. So if you only have 10 minutes, whatever. Uh, I'm lucky that my dad has a rower in the attic at our house. So usually before holiday dinners, I'll go and I'll just pick one of the custom programs that the Concept2 rowers have. My favorite one is this nine rounds of a minute 40 hard row, 20 seconds off. Yeah, it's a real good one. So if you, yeah, so if you want to brutalize yourself uh, and really, really earn that dessert, that's a good one to do. Um, so we've covered what I want to cover, and I just want to take it to you guys. You showed up. Is there anything that you struggle with that you feel like you want to ask a question about or want some support on? Ben, you look like you. Yeah, I was just going to ask you, like, what's the sort of theory around kind of minimizing, like say you're having a big dinner, yeah. kind of minimizing, keeping things clean during the day, and then kind of binging at that one time. Yeah. Still follow the same principles here, or is it sort of like go for it if you're, if you're cool with your macros or whatever? Well, I mean, if, like, if you know what your macros are and those are helping you to make progress, yeah. you can eat all of those for the most part at dinner. Granted, that doesn't take into effect the, the hormones that are gonna, you know, the hormonal effect that's gonna occur right. from doing that. But I mean, you know, if you're controlling your quantity, your body is a pretty smart system. It's going to know what to do for the most part. <laughs> Anybody else? So would you suggest having that waiting and having that big meal or obviously? Eat protein throughout the day. I think doing like some protein snacks and veggies throughout the day, it's usually a good idea. Because then you would assume you would eat less from that eating. Potentially. But you know, just eating throughout the day, especially if you're going to exercise, like if you exercise in the morning, let's say, you shouldn't just feel famished for the rest of the day <laughs> waiting for that big binge meal in the evening. Um, but like I said, you know, there's probably those big meals that you've got uh, with friends or family that like you're looking forward to that are on the calendar. You know, you've got some friends that are good cooks or family that are good cooks really looking forward to that meal. Like just enjoy that whole day guilt free. Don't like binge in the morning because I said that. But like, you know, don't restrict yourself on those four days. Because like I said, research shows that if you just every two weeks have that kind of cheat meal or cheat day, you're not gonna derail yourself too bad. If you're good over the next, let's say, we've got maybe 60, 60 days before the new year, something like that, if you're good for 60 days and, or 56 days and four of them, you're like a little bit off the rails, you're gonna be doing much better than the people who just completely don't give a fuck for the next 60 days. So, you'll be starting off the year on the right foot. All right. Anything else? That's just that's just we were joking right about like yeah. Thursday, Friday, like not just holiday, but like Thursday, Friday, Saturday, like every Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Oh yeah. So like, let's just say that this isn't about one, two, three, four holiday parties. It's actually through like November through December every weekend. There's something. You yeah. Find yourself drinking Thursday, Friday, Saturday nights. Yeah. Like, how much damage do you think we're talking to like our progress and, and all that? It depends how hard you go, really. Like, I have clients who literally drink every night. Uh, it's just a cultural thing. Like, I, you know, certain people from certain cultures, it's just like something they do, you know? At night, they finish with their glass of wine or their glass of whiskey, whatever it happens to be. And, I mean, they're smart. They tell me from the outset, if you give me a plan that doesn't involve my nightcap, then I'm not going to follow it. Uh, so the thing is, you know, if you're going hard those nights, that's kind of a bigger issue that you might want to deal with if you're going like Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday really hard all the time. 
Uh, but you know, if you're just meeting your friends for a drink on a Thursday and that drink, you account for it early in the day, you're like, I know I'm gonna go out, I'm gonna have two drinks. Throw it in your MyFitnessPal food journal, see what the effect is, and then the rest of the day, you're kind of building up to whatever your macros are. Um, then you're gonna be fine, as long as it kind of fits within the template that you're working within or the program you're working within. Uh, but if it just, like, if you go off the rails and you're having like, you know, 10 drinks on one night, you're looking at like 1,200, 1,500 calories right. from alcohol, and it's gonna be really hard to get enough protein in on that day because you've, you know, you don't really have a big calorie allotment that you can deal with outside of the alcohol. So, you know, you either have to really go off the rails in terms of whatever your nutrition program is, or, you know, you've gotta kind of starve yourself all day so that you can drink heavy. So it's kind of a trade off. Yeah. Cool. Well, if y'all don't have any further questions, mm -hmm. we can wrap this up. Yeah. Okay. Of course. Yeah. My pleasure. Let me know how it goes over the holidays. I want to. <laughs> I want to know which of these tips actually. Uh, Helped. Yeah. Exactly.